Detroit lands a very big fish. The NFL Draft is coming in 2024. We'll talk with Mike Tirico about why the event has become so big. And a nasty fight breaks out over our regional water system, even as the state tries to solve our longtime infrastructure problems. Today is Sunday, April 3rd, 2022, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Welcome to April and, no fooling, Welcome to some good pro football news in the city of Detroit. <laughs> Not just good, really big. The 2024 NFL Draft is coming to the Motor City. Now, if you're just a casual football fan or not really a football fan at all, this must all seem crazy. All this to do about a football event that includes not one touchdown, not one completed pass, and when it's all over, only arguments over who won and who lost. The actual winners and losers will probably take months, even years to determine. So what is the fuss? Well, in football crazy America, the NFL has managed to turn the once sleepy affair of selecting college players for professional teams and turned it into the Coachella of the sports world. Consider this, 2006, the city of Detroit hosted the Super Bowl. That event brought about 100,000 people to the city. When Nashville hosted the NFL Draft in 2019, that three-day event brought 600,000 people to town with an economic impact worth well more than $100 million. Again, it's a draft. But then again, two teams play in the Super Bowl. All 32 are dialed in on draft day. Ahead this morning, we're going to talk with Mike Tirico of NBC Sports. Yes, he is one of the broadcast faces of the NFL, but he's also your neighbor. And he was a part of the Detroit bid, and he'll help us understand the stakes. Also today, we're going to dial in on a fascinating city-on-city -city dispute. Is it fair for customers of the Great Lakes Water Authority to have to pony up the money that hasn't been paid by Highland Park? Or is that just how it works in a partnership. We'll talk about that and Lansing's $3 billion effort at fixing Michigan infrastructure today on Flashpoint. You know, Detroit football fans have been dialed in on this year's draft since, oh, probably late October or so. The Lions do have three picks in the first 34 selections. But this week, the big draft news was about the 2024 edition. We have no idea what picks the Lions will have, but we do know where those picks will be made. The NFL delivers the draft and all that it entails to the city of Detroit. Mike Tirico of NBC Sports was a part of the Detroit pitch to the NFL, and somehow Mike has found the time to join us from Augusta, Georgia, where he's readying for the Masters. Uh, Mike, I always I assume your calendar looks a little bit like the periodic table, so I'm very tickled to have you on. Uh, <laughs> as someone who was a part of the effort, what was your reaction when you heard? I think all of us were thrilled, Devin. Uh, I, I guess my place in this conversation about the draft goes really back to being a part of the Detroit Sports Commission, mm -hmm. which brings together a lot of folks who are around the sports industry in Metro Detroit. And I mean representatives of every pro sports team, representatives of the colleges as well, uh, the folks from Rocket, among others, uh, industry leaders from a variety of big companies in Metro Detroit, all together to try to help spread the word nationally of how Detroit is a great place to host a sporting event, and what a great city that we have. Now, last week, or really it's two weeks ago now, People might remember the NCAA wrestling championships were downtown, mm -hmm. a tremendous event for Detroit mm -hmm. and an event I think that was really valuable for everyone around the country to see what a great host we can be. This uh, has been building for a while with the draft. Full credit to everyone in the Lions organization, uh, starting with Sheila Fordham on down to Rod Wood, team president and all the way through. They're the ones who really made this go. But a lot of support from uh, those of us who are part of the Detroit Sports Commission and the great news from the commissioner this week that uh, the NFL world will be coming to us in the spring of 2024. You are far too good of an egg, of course, to, to take too much credit for anything. But I just had to, I was sitting there thinking, well, one of the most prominent broadcast faces of the NFL is urging the NFL to do something. I don't imagine that was lost on them. <laughs> I don't take much credit for anything, especially things that happen at the NFL level. I think this is uh, full credit to the Lions for sure. Mm. And then everybody who has been working on the Sports Commission. We meet uh, four or five times a year, and everyone gets behind every effort that is out there, whether it's the Rocket Mortgage Classic or NCAA events that are coming. We know what this city can be all about, and 
uh, to help spread the word because it's not just come have your event here. There are financial uh, situations involved. Yep. There is a an underpinning for hotel rooms, a variety of different things are needed for, for folks to say, hey, let's come have our event in your city. And it's a great, great amount of teamwork that really also comes back to the city of Detroit as well as the Convention and Visitors Bureau. So it's nice to play on a team like that. Oh, no doubt. Uh, now, some, a lot of these events, when they get bid out, there is such a long window. Look at uh, how long it'll be before the U.S. Open arrives back at Oakland Hills. This is a pretty quick turnaround. And so the things that you're talking about, uh, hotel rooms is always a big worry for these kind of locations. Uh, what does Detroit need to do? Uh, or is there something that Detroit uh, really mm -hmm. needs to be focusing on over these next two years to be ready? Well, I think it's the support and the planning uh, from everyone involved. And that's one thing with so many people involved in this bid and so many helping that I think we'll see. It, it needs to be an entire effort from the area because it will be hotel rooms beyond the city of Detroit. Yeah. We'll see the suburbs involved, as we often do, because we don't have right now the hotel rooms downtown that I think we need to be a long-term player for some of these big events. But we have shown that this can work. So it's going to work. Uh, but I think it's supporting the variety of folks in the community, the restaurants and bars downtown, uh, the, the businesses who are going to get behind this and help. This is a chance for America to see Detroit. Look, the draft Devon has become massive. I, I'm old enough now that I broadcast the first day two of the draft back in the early 90s. <laughs> it was in a hotel ballroom in New York on a weekday <laughs> afternoon. Now it's Thursday night in prime time, Friday night in prime yeah. time and then all day Saturday. It's 32 teams. And, you know, Devin, one advantage we have as a city that I don't think all of us in Metro Detroit realize often enough is how good our airport is and how it really helps us in a situation like this have a centralized location. What do I mean? Seven or eight teams, their fans are about a five-hour drive from us. Fans in Buffalo or Pittsburgh or Chicago and Cleveland and all of those teams, right? So, so you have that. And then you have the airport where, and I find this out with Sunday Night Football, we are a direct flight from Metro Detroit to every NFL city. So the draft, if you look at the last few years, the event in Philadelphia, in Chicago, what it's going to look like in a few weeks in Vegas, it's a destination for fans during the off season, for yeah. football fans to hang out, root for their team and watch the draft. And I think we're going to see a ton of people from out of town come experience Detroit. So back to your question, if all of us are ready with great hospitality and the restaurants downtown and all in Metro Detroit show everyone a good time, people will want to come back and then these big events will come back. So this is a huge opportunity for everyone to see, whether it's the ease of travel or how fun our downtown has become, that we can be a great destination as well for everyone's enjoyment, not just something like the draft or another championship sporting event. But it is, Mike, nuts. It's a draft. It used to be done with a bunch <laughs> no. of guys in a smoky room, hang, you know, with one phone in each ear. And it, it's either, it, it, yes, it says something about the NFL's ability to market itself, that it's turned this into something that people want to watch and attend. It also says a lot about our love affair with football, doesn't it? It does, Devin. I thought uh, one of my friends uh, received a promotion within the NFL this week when we were at the owners meetings and I congratulated him and he said, well, I have a great job in the biggest entertainment vehicle in our country. And that's what the <laughs> NFL has become. Yeah. Think of the number of people that watch the NFL on TV, not just here on Local 4 for Sunday Night Football, but all across the dial, all week, Thursdays, Saturdays now with the late season games, Sundays, Monday nights, the league has generated more interest in its off season than most sports do during their regular season. <laughs> so it tells you the power of the NFL. And, and that's why I think as we watch the Lions, uh, you watch them get the nod to have hard knocks this year. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big deal yeah. because Dan Campbell is a very telegenic. He gives great sound bites. <laughs> the behind the scenes on this team is going to allow the fans here to maybe reconnect with the Lions a little bit. Look, the product hasn't been good on the field. Yep. Everybody there knows it. But you're going to connect with this young team that's getting better, that it is hungry. And I think that's important because you're going to get people cycling back into the stadium. And that doesn't just help the Lions. That helps yeah. all the businesses downtown. You know it. Our, our downtown was in such a good space when COVID hit. 
because yeah. it was going in the right direction. The energy was there and the momentum for the world stopped with COVID. But when you can start thinking about getting those nine Sundays plus a couple of preseason games of 50, 55, 60,000 downtown and having a great time, yeah. then people come back when there's not a game. So hopefully so, but, the power of the NFL yeah. can help the power of downtown Detroit and the uh, continued regrowth of the city as well. Last question I want to ask you, Mike. You're like me. You did not grow up here. You're not a native Michigander, but you've now lived here longer than you've ever lived anywhere else in your life. So yes. <laughs> you, that me, I guess that makes us Michiganders now. But I, I, we've all enjoyed you uh, sort of embracing your connection now to the place, and you really have grown attached to it, haven't you? I love it. I am uh, downriver by marriage. Uh, my wife grew up in Trenton and my in-laws still live down that way and I just love Metro Detroit I love the yeah. people yeah. I love the pride that we all have in anything that is Michigan or anything Detroit and Devin I'm, I'm traveling around the country and you see somebody with an old English D ball cap on and immediately you smile you say hi yep. uh, it, it, it feels like for me like my Syracuse my alma mater I see somebody in Syracuse I say something to them you feel the same way about Detroit uh, whether it's going up north or going downtown or in the suburbs, there's some connection I think we all have of a very special place. Uh, it's where our kids are born, it's where our kids were raised. We love living here, we're gonna be here a long time. And uh, I'm really thankful that everyone here has welcomed our family as much yeah. as we've welcomed Detroit as part of our lives. Well, it's a big part of why we have such pride in watching what you do from the Olympics to the Super Bowl to Thank everything you. else. Mike, thanks so much for the time. Enjoy the Masters and we'll talk to you again soon. Same here. We'll do this in person next time, not with a door hinge behind me <laughs> uh, in some closet in Augusta. So I look forward to seeing you. Keep, keep up the great work. Uh, Local 4 is one of the best NBC affiliates in the country. We and appreciate that. because yeah. of you and Kimberly and what everybody does on the air. So keep up the great work. Thanks so much, Mike. We'll take a quick break. Back with more. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Discover BetMGM Casino. <laughs> and leap into a world filled with all your favorite casino games. Plus, more exclusive ones you can't find anywhere else. The biggest progressive jackpots that keep growing and earn BetMGM rewards that turn points into perks. BetMGM Casino. Start your adventure today and get 100% deposit match up to $1,000, plus $25 on the house. I use my brain power to help kids realize theirs. I am Henry. When Tyler got his new heart, ours became whole again. We are Henry. I'm a bike rider and a rare cancer survivor. I am Henry. I'm a patient from point A to point B. I am Henry. I am Henry. I am Henry. When you found your inner believer and all-around conqueror, you found your Henry. It's time to drive down your payment. Refinance your current auto loan with MSU Federal Credit Union and save with rates as low as 2.24% APR. In the market for a new car, we offer the same great rate as low as 2.24% for new and used. Plus, we offer flexible terms with no application fees and no prepayment penalties. Visit us today at msufcu.org, stop by any branch, or give us a call to refinance today. APR is annual percentage rate. Hank, it seems like everybody's having trouble making ends meet. And what are we going to do about these gas prices? Well, there's carpooling. The bus is an option. You think people would really try that? I think so. I mean, I'll try it. But, you know, it's not just the cost of gas. We're talking about the rising price of groceries, too. It's a lot to talk about. So make sure you stick with Local 4 all week long as we figure out some ways to help you make ends meet. Monday morning at 6.30, as grocery prices rise. We want to talk stacking meals. How to get the most meals for your money. Monday on Local 4 News Today. Welcome back. Seems like so many of our fights and struggles in Michigan for the last several years have been about water. Tainted water in Flint, water bursting through the Edenville Dam, controversial water shutoffs, and of course, water backing up on freeways and in basements during torrential storms. Well, the latest water fight involves the Great Lakes Water Authority, or GLIWA. They're trying to spread Highland Park's unpaid water bills among the nearly 90 municipalities under the authority, but around a third of them, and the list keeps growing, are saying 
no way. Happy to have with me the interim CEO of the Great Lakes uh, Water Authority, Suzanne Coffey, and the Public Works Commissioner from Macomb County, Candace Miller. Thank you both so much for coming. It's so nice to have people back in person. We're, yes, it it yes. won't be novel uh, soon, but right now it still is. So let me start with you. Um, we, some folks are starting to describe this as a little bit of a mutiny. I think you take issue with that description, but describe what's going on right now. Yeah, so I, I don't see it necessarily as a mutiny. I, I really see us rallying around to try to raise awareness on an issue that needs to be solved, right? So uh, we, we need a resolution to it, and I see that people are frustrated, and I understand that frustration. So uh, from our perspective, raising awareness, uh, I wish it didn't have to be quite so controversial, but the reality is raising awareness is going to help us to get the problem solved. Well, it's certainly raising awareness among, uh, among the citizenry, mm -hmm. but the folks who are involved, like Candace Miller, are maybe a little too aware, or, or do you think that, they, that, that the folks that are the stakeholders uh, the leaders of these uh, municipalities don't fully understand it yet. You know, I think they do understand it now, frankly. I, I think that uh, it's taken a bit to get that education out there, but I think they understand it. Mm. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a complex matter, and I think they've taken the time that's needed to understand it very well. Uh, Candace Miller, you were part of the group that we heard in Macomb County this past week at a news conference. Um, you've been joined at quite a few communities in uh, Wayne County, most recently a big group of downriver communities. Is it a mutiny? <laughs> you know what it is. First of all, I think it's important to note this is not the Great Lakes Water Authority's fault. Really, no, no, no. We, sure. we are part of the Great Lakes Water Authority. Everybody doesn't know that, but it came out of the bankruptcy. So you've got this whole region, really, mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. members of the Great Lakes Water Authority. So we're sort of all in this problem together, which was started in 2012 by the state, actually, who at that time made Gliwa take on Highland Park, right. who previously were on their own with water and sewer, but they had a water plant that wasn't it was junk, okay, yeah, yes, and it's even yes. worse now. It needs to be bulldozed. It's never going to be fixed. And they've been but, moved off of the system again since then. Yes. But by the way, let me quickly mention, we did invite uh, leadership from Highland Park to be here. I, I, I believe lawyers intervened and suggested that, that might not be Those the right. Those darn attorneys. Take, dar yeah. they, they ruined more episodes of Flashpoint, yeah, let me tell yeah. you. But so, so what is the best approach? Because I think some people would suggest, look, you're a part of a consortium, and for better or worse, uh, the debts are everybody's. They are, but what we're trying to do is force the state to engage, quite frankly. This whole issue, in my opinion, a million opinions out there, in my opinion, was really caused by the state by forcing Gliwa to take on Highland Park. Highland Park, over these last 10 years, has paid some of their bills, but not enough. And actually, they haven't paid any bill for the last year. If you don't pay your water bill, guess what happens? Uh, they shut your water off. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful about that. We can't be shutting off water to an entire community. Nine, ten thousand yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, they're children, they're babies, okay? We're not talking about that, but we want the state to engage, sit everybody down at the table. We have to resolve this issue because we are not going to continue, we being any of the GLEWA members, continue to pay for Highland Parks taking advantage of their neighbors. Your thoughts then, Sue? So, no, I, I completely agree that it's it's a very frustrating situation, right? We do have to make sure that we're providing that high quality water to all of our member partners, and we are a consortium. And I, that's why I said I do think that this is really about us all coming together to get that awareness. I do think the state can help us to solve this problem. I think Highland Park wants this problem solved. I think we want this problem solved. We all do. So but, that's one uh, thing we have in common. Interesting. The governor, through a spokesman this week, said, uh, you guys need to figure that out. Now, I couldn't figure out who, what, wh who that meant. Did that mean Lansing? Did that mean a legislative approach? Or did that mean it people like... It was the like attorney, <laughs> probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was. The, it was. Yeah. I knew who it was. It was the attorney saying that. By the way, he was saying, you guys, they are one of you guys because part the of governor it. has an appointee uh -huh. on the GLEWA and in the, in, the, in the state, not this particular governor, but it's, it's now on her watch, unfortunately. But, you know, it has to be dealt with. They have to engage. So they are part of the you guys. But isn't it kind of, uh, it's funny that we're, we've been watching this debate on the international stage about NATO membership. Isn't this a situation where you're all members of this same group, the bills come due, everybody's liable for them? Yeah, except the state. They don't actually get billed, right? Even though they have a a dog in the hunt, so to speak. You know, the governor does have an appointee on GLEWA. I mean, they don't actually get billed. Mm -hmm. We don't bill the state of Michigan, but we're billing everybody else. So we're, what we've said in Macomb, and this is really what all the communities are doing now, most of them, and I think uh, some of the, uh, the other counties that haven't probably will be next. Uh, we're just asking that our member communities withhold a portion of their water and sewer bills 
that would be paying for the Highland Park section. We obviously can't withhold all of our bills. We're really hurting ourselves. Bond ratings, other kinds of things. We're aware of that, but we have to bring this to a head. Uh, folks are like, look, I work hard, I pay my bill. What is this with Highland Park? Yeah, I, th I think the real, the real idea here is the state can help us come together. If we could have solved this with Highland Park, it would be solved by now. Right, it's multiple lawsuits. Does it muddy the picture that they're not really a part of it anymore? I mean, they're, the, the debt is still there. I guess they are a part of it that way. So, so when you say they are not a part of it, meaning? Of the water system anymore. Haven't they moved, they've moved. Highland Park? Didn't they move their water, uh, their, their water was, because it was found to be cloudy. Oh, yeah, we're providing water to them. So, so yeah, that's it, the matter. The matter is, they, yes. yeah, their water treatment plant is not functional right, right. now, right? So they'd ask us to come in and, and so we are, their residents are drinking Great Lakes Water Authority water, right? That's the issue. Yeah. That's the issue yeah. is that we have affordability issues. Everyone's concerned about that. It's an equity issue as well. Mm -hmm. And the reality is people need to pay for the service that they're receiving. That's the issue. And we need the state to come in and help. It's been going on way too long, as, as Candace had said, right? This is coming up on 10 years ago. Yeah, it's 10 it's, years, it'll be 10 years in November, right? We have, have filed the lawsuits. We're working through the courts. But the reality is we need a good solution that works for Highland Park, that works for GLWA, and doesn't put it on the backs of the others. And we are looking at talking about all these lawsuits that have been going on for the last 10 years. In Macomb, we've engaged our legal counsel, and uh, we are going to be filing an amicus brief on one of the mm -hmm. lawsuits. Mm -hmm. We are going to be intervening on another lawsuit. We're contemplating the option of actually suing Highland Park ourselves or suing the state ourselves. Uh, none of which, which we want to do, right? Which is go figure this yeah, out. Yeah, go figure this right? out. Yeah, well, we could figure it out, but we need the state to sort of be the, uh, yeah. uh, to be, uh, they do have a seat at the table, you know, so they need to sit at the table. Our last couple of minutes, I'd like to broaden the conversation. We just saw this massive uh, uh, infrastructure package pass in Lansing. A lot of this is one-time money, which needs to be spent in a different way, I think. Uh, clearly, infrastructure, there's, there's a lot of different places, especially roads that get all of the, uh, a lot of the headlines, mm -hmm. but water because I just mentioned how many different problems we have with water right now. Right. Uh, what kind of opportunity we have in front of us and what do we need to do? Well, I can only speak for Macomb County and I know Great, Great Lakes Water Authority also got some cash, but we got $72 million out of this mm -hmm. last bill. Mm -hmm. It is for projects that are one-time transformational projects, which was really the intent, I think, of these federal dollars. Right. So just quickly, a, a, you know, maintenance, a couple right. of projects on our sewer interceptor. I've got a couple of projects to stop combined sewer overflows from... Uh, spoiling our magnificent Great Lakes. I have a, a new pump station that we're building at a pump uh, station that has not had a new pump since 1968. Does it so, feel, what you're talking about, does it feel transformational or absolutely. does it feel like you need more? Well, you always need more. Always. I mean, I have lots of other projects, but uh, you know, this is a huge down payment and uh, I'm very appreciative of it. Your thoughts on yeah, it? Yeah, so we, we received 25 million, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very appreciative of that, but we have huge needs, right? I think uh, we certainly have been under investing in our water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We look at roads, we can see roads, we know that roads need help. Under the ground, water pipes, wastewater pipes, drainage pipes. There's three networks of pipes that are under all those roads. And we have infrastructure that's 100 plus years old. So $25 million is great. It's a great start, right? And we're happy to have that. But we spend about $200 million in capital improvements a year. One of our pump stations, we have two pump stations we're upgrading that were built in uh, the 1920s, the 1930s, $250 million to upgrade those pump stations. So on the regional side, we're happy it's coming, we need more. It's amazing how fast $3 billion can go when you're yeah. starting to talk about infrastructure. And I'm curious, you spent a lot of time in Congress where you were constantly you being to told- You me of that, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. <laughs> PTSD a little bit yeah, from right. there. But it, you were constantly being besieged with you know infrastructure talk, uh, demands, requests. Now you're on this side of it. Does Congress have a clue? Uh, do members of Congress really get the infrastructure problems in America. I think what members of Congress need to do is listen to their local officials that are involved in mm -hmm. the infrastructure and try to figure it out from there. I mean, you can't be an expert on everything, but you have to uh, uh, have a high degree of confidence in what your local leaders are telling you. And I will say one thing, also how you spend this money. Don't rat hole it. So we invite the state to come in and audit us. The feds want to mm -hmm. come in and mm -hmm. audit us. Everything is up on our website, transparency, accountability, always. I so appreciate you both coming today. Thank you.